All right, I'm Lindsay Dayton Berryman, and I was born in Chicago, Illinois, actually Evanston, Illinois, and uh, moved to Minneapolis with my sister and parents uh, when I was two and a half. Um, the oldest of six children and um, grew up on uh, Lake Minnetonka in a little town of 5,000 called Deep Haven. My parents were active in city government. Uh, my mother was a uh, city councilor and my father city council and mayor. And um, I learned, I did a lot of community um, volunteering through them. One story I love to share is my mother was on the Minneapolis Red, in the Minneapolis Red Cross chapter on their board of directors and uh, when it was time to go out and raise money for the Red Cross she would grab up her six children and throw them in a van with uh, a bullhorn on the top and she'd put red, arm band, red cross armbands on her arms and uh, hand us uh, containers for money and red cross uh, emblem on that as well. We were to bring two or three friends along and she would tell us when you go through the neighborhoods, ring the doorbell and say, please give generously to the American Red Cross and she would go up and down the streets with her bulldog saying the same thing. So those uh, kinds of uh, events were what I grew up with. Community was very big um, in my family. And um, uh, so when I went through life later, um, that came up very strongly with me. I want to share a couple other things. One in high school, we did those um, um, aptitude tests, and I came, I tested as a um, mechanical engineer. And I'll never forget Mr. Deers telling me that girls couldn't be mechanical engineers, so I should think about nursing. And uh, that was a flashpoint for me that didn't feel good. Um, I got into nursing school and um, found the love of my life. We got married and uh, the nursing school said they didn't want me to be in the nursing school as a married student. I was their first married student and that was a flashpoint. Um, I stayed with it and then of course got pregnant and they weren't happy about that as well. So I agreed to take a time out at six months because I wasn't supposed to show to the patients. So they didn't want their patients at the hospital knowing that uh, a woman could be pregnant and work at the same time or be in school at the same time. Um, so it was a big moment when both of us graduated, uh, him, my husband from medical school and myself from nursing school. That I carried with me as well. Um, we spent three years in Germany uh, when, while he was in the service and another um, learning experience for me there was understanding another culture. Um, we lived on the economy, which means we weren't on the army base, in the army base, but with the people in their village. I put my children in the village kindergarten and um, one day uh, one of the village women came knocking at the door saying, we're going to be playing foosball and would you like to be on the team? I thought they were inviting me, but as it turned out, one of the moms from the school was inviting me and they were picking their teams and of course I was last to be picked and neither team wanted me. So Marga, the uh, neighbor who had recruited me, said, we'll take her on our team. And I asked, um, if it was the first time they'd played together and they said, oh no, they pick the same team every year. And also, they lost every year. And I told them they weren't gonna lose this year. I was very good at what they called foosball, was dodgeball. And I began to teach them how to play. We did have uh, the first game right there when we had recruited our teams. And um, I 
gave the team some quick tips on sh give the ball to me and I'll get the person out. I was very athletic and I said, and if you're in the middle and someone is right-handed, you jump to the right and if they're left-handed, you jump to the left and then change it up every other time. We wound up winning that game. We won all but two games during the season and um, the next year, when it came time to pick the team, the other team got the toss and they picked me and I said, no, I'm gonna stick with my team. Um, so it was an interesting uh, cultural experience. I also learned um, that with good knowledge and self-determination um, and uh, a feeling that you knew what you were doing, you could be a good leader and people would follow no matter what culture they were from. So uh, that was an oh yeah moment for me. Um, by this point we had three daughters and that's what I wound up with, three daughters. We didn't have any more, but they all um, spoke German by the time we went home to um, the, the States. We wound up in Oregon, um, my husband doing a residency and then found Medford in 1974. We loved Medford um, because of the mountains and the streams and the lakes. We, we loved to hike and experience that. Um, you know, we loved the downtown and the fact that they were uh, honoring their heritage and um, they had a Carnegie Library and, um, you know, Bear Creek ran through the town. It uh, was all very uh, intriguing to us. So we loved, we loved um, locating here and within two months of buying a house and settling in uh, we we're up in the hills uh, housing started to develop around us and I went down to City Hall and said what's going on and um, the planning director who was Jim Eisenhart excellent planning director shoved a comprehensive plan toward me well it turns out that cities had just been required to develop comprehensive plans and uh, according to a state um, law that had just been implemented. And I looked at this inch thick document and said, can you just earmark what you want me to read in this? And uh, he earmarked the transportation element, which was the policies and goals for transportation planning in the city of Medford along with the other elements, which I did get to later. Um, but in reading through it, I realized that the development was being developed without following the comprehensive plan. So uh, uh, I was a little bit incensed by it because we'd found the space that we wanted to live in for the rest of our lives, hoping we would have a little bit of uh, relief from neighbors and nature, which I absolutely loved. And um, I went looking for an attorney. Well, I went to four attorneys and none of them was willing to help me. They all were uh, helping developers uh, develop Medford and they didn't want to be tagged for being someone who was against development uh, in the valley. Finally, someone suggested John Eads, who was a former city attorney who had actually written Medford's comprehensive plan. And John Eads became quite a mentor to me. He also, uh, gratis, helped, helped me form coalitions, helped me um, identify what the avenues were uh, to uh, address what was happening in my neighborhood. Uh, and we wound up filing a lawsuit against the city of Medford for not following their comprehensive plan. During all this, I had heard that um, water runoff was going into the Lone Pine area, so I went down, talked to some of the people who were upset, and formed a coalition with them. I started a coalition in our neighborhood, and also heard that Lazy Creek was expanding and breaking down um, backyards of people in uh, the Murphy Road area, the Lazy Creek area, 
and I formed a coalition with them. So we had three areas of concern uh, that we took with us when we went to the city council. Um, we wound up winning our lawsuit against the city of Medford. It was a precedent-setting case in the state of Oregon uh, for land use um, applications. Um, at the end of this lawsuit, I can remember sitting at home thinking about what had just taken place and thinking, if these yo-yos can do it, so can I. And at that point, I determined I would run for city council. Um, backtracking a little bit, some of our investigations had found that there was a corporation that was called the Robin Hood Corporation um, that owned a lot of the lane, land around the home that I had, we had purchased and the property that was being built. And one of their board members was actually on the city council, had been engineering um, the move to get the property quickly developed because they were realizing that the land use laws were going to inhibit their, um, their plans for the future. Uh, I got a team together and we recalled that city councilor because I felt that was not corrupt government, but not quite really on the up and up. And um, uh, that was one of the reasons that I felt I wanted to run for city government. And um, my self-righteous personhood uh, um, gave me a lot of, uh, well, it made me angry, but it all, the anger also um, incensed me and, and made me determined to try and set things uh, right at least make some changes in city government. The lawsuit left me with lots to think about. At the same time, uh, I was finishing up a business degree at Southern Oregon University. I had gone back to get a degree because initially my nursing degree was a diploma, three-year diploma, which is what um, most schools were offering at the time that I went through nursing. Um, and now we're requiring a four-year degree in order to um, be more validated, I'm going to say. Uh, so I got a, a degree in business uh, and graduated just uh, a week after the lawsuit consummated. And um, then within a couple years, I started a woman-owned business called the Cookie Connection. And I had that business for 16, 17 years. Um, uh, initial, initially, the first location was in downtown Medford, but um, expanded to the Rogue Valley Mall. And uh, actually, there was one at the Medford Center, too, that was initial. So Medford Center and downtown um, businesses, uh, I, I, I started with a business partner, Caprice Moran, and then when the Rogue Valley Mall came to town, we recognized that that would be taking a lot of the traffic, and so we opened a, a cookie connection at the mall as well. Um, Caprice, my business partner, um, got pregnant, had a baby, and decided she wanted to be a mom, so I bought her out after three or four years uh, and uh, managed the business myself. So. Uh, I also ran uh, for city council, and um, I used a lot of the people who were part of my coalitions uh, when I uh, filed the lawsuit, when we filed the lawsuit against the city, uh, to be on my campaign team. So uh, I had, from the Lone Pine Group, I had a uh, uh, supporters in Ward 1, and from the Lazy Creek group I had supporters in Ward 4. Um, I had done a lot of work with the uh, East, uh, West Medford Coalition, and I found support from that group as well. Uh, I had supporters from the Manor, um, because I was on the Manor board at the time, and uh, so I was finding I had a, a lot of support from um, many parts of the city. 
Um, but it, they helped me put together my campaign um, for City Council, which was in Ward 4. We started in January meeting. I put together a kitchen cabinet in February. In March, I put together an advisory team. And um, by June, I was declaring we had a, a slam dunk team that we were focused and we knew what we were doing and um, I was getting all sorts of input from the community. You'll never beat Mel Winkleman, he was running against me. He's a strong businessman and um, very powerful. And I said to myself, just watch me. Because at that point, we had our team together, we were organized and we were moving. And uh, I did win that election and um, served for six years on the city council and it was really good background um, for me on how city government worked. Also had my woman-owned business at the same time that was expanding and at this point I had four units, um, the one downtown, uh, one in the Medford Center, one at the Rogue Valley Mall and then one at the newly developed um, Southgate. Um, actually, no, I take that back. That one was another four or five years off. Um, my girls were teenagers now. My three girls were teenagers and my husband called uh, stop on me. He said, you're, you're in too deep. You've got too much going. Um, and you're not able to do well on any of them. So pick what you want to do. Pick one that you need to let go of. And I said, well, I love my business. And I love the city council. Is it okay if I give the three daughters away? And he said, no, that should be your number one. So I said, well, okay. So I resigned from the city council. It was very difficult to do. It was, I was in a second term at this point and uh, I've always felt like I needed to um, see things through to the end and it was hard for me to step away. But it did give me time to reflect and um, to get the business um, organized and moving better at the same time. I had Otto Frohmeyer come knocking at the door Otto Frommeyer was also a, a good mentor that I had um, through my years. And Otto said, I've been in the Frommeyer Death Ridge building, which was also the theater at one end, for all my business life, and I don't want it torn down. I want you to save it. And I said, um, Otto, I can't save the theater unless I sit on the theater board. Well, it was 4 o'clock when he was in my office, and by 4.30 he called me and said, you're on the board and we're meeting tonight at 5.30. So at 5.30 I show up at a meeting, and I find that the Rogue Gallery and Art Center um, has been given this building and asked to restore the theater. They had no money. Um, they had kind of looked at the theater as a, um, a stepchild. They didn't have money to deal with it. The roof was leaking. Um, it needed attention badly. And Otto Frommeyer sat at one end of the table and Dunbar Carpenter sat at the other end. And while they both wanted the same thing to happen, they wanted to restore the theater, um, they, ha they were coming at it from different directions. And they were never going to get there because they were fighting each other on how to make it happen. So I went back to Otto the next day and I said to Otto, in order for this to occur, you need to step off the board of directors. Um, he was aghast, of course, and I explained to him what I saw happening, that I looked to putting together um, an advisory committee and that I would have him on the advisory committee and that we needed to have our own 501c3 
and step away from the gallery because the gallery didn't have the funding to do anything and we'd have to raise the money as our own 501c3 to turn the criterion around um, which is what happened and um, I put together a really good steering committee uh, and Otto was the head of that steering committee and he gave me a lot of tips on what doors to knock on and um, how to raise the money. In the meantime, the board uh, had to put together um, a business plan for our 501c3 and uh, identify what our goals were and what we planned to do with the dollars we were raising. So um, after five years of my life, uh, knocking on doors, we managed to raise the money needed. Actually, within two, three years, we raised the 2.2 million that the architect told us we would need. And as they started to um, make the changes and renovate the Criterion Theater, um, s and James, uh, Tom Hall came to me and said, the architect didn't do um, core samples and none of these walls can stand alone. There's only one that we can leave remain standing. Everything's going to have to come down. And I said, how much more money? He said, three million more. So um, I had just said thank you to our uh, development team and uh, I was looking at having to go out and find three million more dollars. Um, at the time, I had stepped on to the Urban Renewal Board. We had identified, I think, something like nine or ten programs or projects that Urban Renewal would be um, implementing during the 20 years of its existence. I'm going to segue a little bit because uh, on that board I had uh, talked with other board members and suggested that if we took an arm down to the south interchange and put those lands in our urban renewal district, um, we could develop those lands. They were all in public holdings, so held by the city, the county, the federal government all had big parcels of land there that we were able to accumulate at no cost, develop, and because of tax increment financing, all the taxes that came out of those properties we could uh, use to develop downtown Medford. So this was happening at the same time that we were raising money for the Criterion, and I was able to go to Urban Renewal when we got to this point of, oh my gosh, we needed three million more, and ask Urban Renewal if they would um, put 600,000 in, which they agreed to do. I went to Len Hannum and asked him to get some money from the state. Another 600,000 came from him. Um, you know, slowly we pieced together uh, more and more until we had uh, 400,000 to go, and I had nowhere to go but to the city of Medford, who were poo-pooing this whole thing all along. And um, what I found was they just wanted to be asked. And I went to the city manager initially, and I said, I'm going to come to the city council and ask for a final $400,000. And he said, it's not coming out of my budget. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm still going to make the ask. And he said, over my dead body, I said, I'm still going to make the ask. So I went in front of the council feeling very unsettled, like I had absolutely no support. And, uh, but I had lobbied each of the council members independently and given them the story. And when I got in front of them, uh, I said, I'm down to 400000 That's all it takes to make the Criterion Theater, the centerpiece of downtown Medford, and I'm counting on you, city uh, fathers, to do this. And they voted unanimously to give us the money. So 
that was a hurrah day and um, the criterion moved forward urban renewal was able to move forward um, we did a lot of projects for downtown uh, on the urban renewal board which I'm really really proud of um, there was a parking structure we brought RCC into the downtown uh, we built a uh, Jackson County public new public library uh, and the Criterion Theater um, the library RCC the Criterion Theater and then um, later uh, when I was mayor was able to work with Elizabeth Zinzer to establish a higher education building in downtown all were part of or continue to be a part of along with the Rogue Gallery and Arts Center a cultural education district that Urban Renewal uh, saw as one leg of the stool of rebuilding downtown Medford. A second leg of the stool was the Civic Center and if you at the time we had the county courthouse and the uh, city hall but we identified that area as an area where all civic uh, buildings should cluster and we now have the juvenile facility there we have the uh, Jackson County um, uh, I'm blanking courthouse. The courthouse yeah but also the jail and um, the City Hall has done some expansion now they've expanded their building uh, into some others that were close by. They've built a parking structure and Health and Human Services uh, came in and took over the post office when they moved out. So that whole area was a second leg of the stool for urban renewal. Um, the third leg was to develop um, headquartered businesses and uh, we went to Harry and David, but they had already developed a headquarters uh, south of town and weren't willing to come in. Uh, we went to Lithia, and Lithia, uh, the younger generation, said, we want to be in downtown Medford. And it was the latter part of urban renewal when they built their headquartered building. Uh, and then One West Main came in. Uh, this was after my time, but it also was a part of the thinking uh, where we've got um, ProCare Software is a nationally headquartered building. Uh, we have PRS, Pacific Retirement Services, uh, which is a national organization that's headquartered in downtown Medford. And then uh, Rogue Disposal, which is not a national firm, but they do um, wonderful works and they have uh, developed a methane gas, um, methane gas to power a lot of the um, ODOT's um, vehicles, their rogue disposal vehicles, and also um, RBTD vehicles. So they have been uh, letting other communities around the U.S. know how they can, how those communities can take their garbage, turn them into methane gas, and power their own vehicles, which um, I give them five stars for. So life gets kind of messy. It goes back and forth, um, and we have to. I go down one track uh, with one group of people and then have to come back and go down another track with another group of people. But the Medford City Council in 1988 decided that it would be a good time to form a, an urban renewal agency. And at the time, um, I was not on the council, uh, was paying attention to business and paying attention to my girls. Uh, but when I saw them uh, forming the Urban Renewal uh, Board, I felt like this was an opportunity for me to get back into government without being on the city council, without having to run for office. A lot of what I was picking up from the community was that 
people had a low community esteem. They talked about Dreadford. They talked about Deadford. Um, they, they didn't see Medford as the lovely place where I'd come to settle down. Um, and I, I couldn't understand it because it's a beautiful valley and we have so much to offer. There didn't seem to be any uh, appreciation of those that came before us, of the ranchers or the timber barons or the orchardists. Um, while we loved the pear blossoms, there wasn't an appreciation of, of all the, the people that came before us struggled with to make us the valley that we are today. And for some reason, Medford felt, because they didn't have a Shakespeare festival, because they didn't have a Brit festival, they didn't have anything to be proud of. And what they weren't recognizing as a community that, that I saw as so important to us was that we were the financial hub of Southern Oregon and Northern California. We were the medical hub of Southern Oregon and Northern California. We were the business hub of Southern Oregon and, Medi and uh, uh, Northern California. And, you know, we were providing a lot of the basis for jobs and um, creativity on a different level than Shakespeare. Um, we were looking at creativity in our businesses and how we uh, can expand our job opportunities and provide for families. Um, at the same time, you could go into downtown Medford at the cross of Medford, uh, um, Maine and Central and stand at that corner and say, you know, this is where 40, 50, 60 years ago people would stand and they'd talk about, you know, horse trading and who was having the babies and who married who and who had died. It was where all information was being exchanged and it was really the heritage of our uh, Southern Oregon beginnings. And uh, we needed to um, take it to heart and um, appreciate it and hold it up and feel good about ourselves. And so on the Urban Renewal Board, we're looking at those pieces of our community and how we can raise them up and feel proud about them. The Criterion Theater people felt really proud about because the whole community participated in raising those dollars. Lynn Sholin came in and he formed a community organization that went out and helped us find hundreds of thousands of dollars that brought us to our goal. Uh, so it wasn't one or two, the effort of one or two people, it was a community effort. It was a building block for downtown and it was seen as a cornerstone for uh, downtown Medford's uh, revitalization. So, uh, as we worked through urban renewal, it was a district. So you can draw a line around urban renewal and where the line is is where urban renewal either stops or starts and the city stops or starts. And as urban renewal would put in a sidewalk, it'd stop at that line. And the city wasn't a bit interested in picking up the building and extending it further. The same with sewer lines and water lines and uh, any kind of infrastructure uh, was hard to implement those changes because they would stop at a point where it had old infrastructure and we had to figure out a way what was going to work, what wasn't going to work, what we needed to address, what we couldn't address and had to put off for later. Um, and I learned very quickly that we needed to have a vision for the city of Medford as well as the vision that we had for urban renewal. And I took the lessons learned at urban renewal and um, decided that I would run for mayor and I would run on the platform of a vision uh, for the future of Medford. And, um, and I would go back to those people who had participated in all that we had done, whether it was the lawsuit to improve our neighborhoods 
and get our roads in order and our storm drains in order, or whether it was our cultural uh, groups that wanted the Criterion Theater to be uh, a prominent piece of their life. Um, I went to all those organizations that felt and saw their life reviving, and you could, you could see and feel this new um, sense of we're okay coming up through the people. So um, I'd been in business now for 16, 17 years, and I put the business on the market. I thought if I run for mayor, I might win, and um, I'm going to have all eyes on me. Everybody's going to be the first woman mayor for the city of Medford, and everybody's going to be gauging me against my male counterparts. So not only did I have to do things really well, I had to do them better than really well. Everything I did, I had to do better than really well uh, because I was being watched closely and people were talking about it. And I was also setting the stage for other women in the community who might want to follow suit. They might want to be on the city council. They might want to run for mayor. They want, might want to be um, a publisher of the Tribune or, um, you know, head of RCC or Southern Oregon University, um, which we did have in place. We had females in place at that time, but but it was a time of uh, where women were unsure of what they could do and what they couldn't do. Um, they weren't feeling comfortable that they could challenge the male system or move into a position that had been held by a male and feel comfortable that they could do it as well. Um, they needed to be uplifted. Women needed to be uplifted as well as the community. And I sensed that and so I sold the business and um, got my ducks in a row. Um, I went throughout the community to put together an advisor, advisory board made up of all segments of our community. I had a medical um, personnel that was on my advisory team. I had someone from business. I had someone from small business as well as large business. I had someone uh, from um, the service sectors and the um, mental health department. Um, trying to get a cross-section of the financial world, the, you know, the cross-section of Medford and who we were, give me input as I ran my campaign for mayor on um, what was most important. And we were able to put together um, a whole uh, list of issues that could be addressed when I was speaking to the community and to community members. But we also uh, ran on a theme of vision leadership results, which we were recognizing is what the community needed as a whole to pull them up further, to self-actualize, in essence, as a community. And um, this group was very important toward helping me turn around and speak to the people that I was addressing that were residents and members of the community and be able to go to a certain segment. Let's say we went to talk to the doctors or the nurses. That person that was on my advisory team was giving me input on how I needed to address them so that I could change my way of, of seeing that fabric piece of the community, what they were doing, um, how they were contributing and how I could encourage and what what we could do better. Find out from them what, what can we do better. Um, so each segment of the community that I spoke with, I, I was garnering more and more information about um, what our Medford was all about. I ran on the thesis of vision leadership results, but I also told community members as we went along that we were going to have a vision for the city of Medford and that would be the first thing I would do when I stepped into office. After I was elected mayor, um, I had a plethora of people come in to me 
with their ideas and their expectations and their hopes and their dreams and it was like no one expected me to win but everybody hoped I would. It was amazing to me, it was amazing to the community and um, I turned to the city manager my first day on the job and said we have to get this vision document going and here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to, when we do our State of the City address, which is done by the mayor's office every year in January in front of the Chamber of Commerce, I want to present that we are going to implement this vision and, uh, and, and get it moving at that time. So uh, we put together um, an initial presentation and I can remember standing in front of the Chamber of Commerce and saying, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Just put your minds at ease and listen to your hearts. Do you feel it? Do you feel that we are going to be a different community soon? Um, I said, I feel it. I see it in your eyes. I know that everybody wants to see this happen. So I want you to take a business card out right where you want to see the city move, what, what you want captured during this vision, visioning process, and leave it on the table. I had 350 business cards came in to me. We had 350 participants in the visioning process. We worked through the school district and we had 600 students sending in their either pictures or comments or um, hopes and dreams for what they wanted for the city of Medford and the skate park was an outcome of that. Um, so, you know, we listened to all segments when we did this visioning and it took a year and a half to go through the process and we got a document, a vision for Medford in the 21st century and the thought occurred to me it's easy for these things to go on the shelf and be forgotten. So I went to some of the leaders from each of the groups and I said, what do you think about putting the vision to the budget? And I had, I think, six or eight who felt really strongly that that needed to happen so that it wouldn't be forgotten, it wouldn't be left on the shelf. So I got a team, I think it was like 15 um, people, steering committee, to come together at a city council meeting, they presented the idea. Uh, the council approved it, um, much to the city manager's dismay, because you have to recognize that the city manager's job is to put together the city budget. The council's job is to identify the policies and um, the uh, different constituencies needs and then the city manager figures out a way to finance it. Well this was a whole strategic plan on a vision for the 21st century for the city of Medford. Every single department of the city was impacted from public works to parks to um, even departments like uh, cultural education uh, that weren't a part of City Hall and we had to put, figure out how to put a budget to it and then each department had to identify how they were going to implement their budget. Um, that was probably the smartest move of my whole career, <laughs> right there in a nutshell, because it did require that the City of Medford follow through on our vision and implement it um, at least for the time I was in office and for probably the next 10 years afterwards. So as we go through this, I'm sitting in my office. I'm, I'm in my office every day, uh, usually for three hours, sometimes morning, sometimes afternoon, depending on um, when people needed to see me. I would always get someone waltzing in the door saying, I have a vision, Mayor, I have a vision.
version. Where did we leave off? <laughs> so Elizabeth Udall uh, came into my office, I think it was like March of 2000, and said, I have a vision, Lindsay, I have a vision. And I said, what's your vision? And she said, it's of uh, an arts, arts and flowering festival in downtown Medford that I've seen one in the Northeast and um, I think we should be doing one in Medford as well. And uh, I said, I think it's a great idea, Elizabeth, and I know who to hook you up with because a couple other people had also been thinking of some kind of a, an arts festival in downtown Medford. But what Elizabeth did was pulled our cultural issues in, the, the smudge pots that we had in the orchards, and she suggested that we um, commission artists to decorate them and, uh, and sell them, and that can make money for the festival continuing. Uh, we could decorate the artists' renderings of the smudge pots um, with flowers around them. And, so the idea was to sell floral displays as well as uh, focus on the arts and uh, it was a fabulous uh, festival and it's still going today, um, very exciting. Another visionary that walked into my office was Elizabeth Zinzer who was then um, president of Southern Oregon University and she told me that she had a vision of having a higher education building in downtown Medford uh, that would bring Southern Oregon University and RCC together and hopefully at a time in the future um, Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls which since they have put together a three-way um, agreement on uh, sharing their studies and their students and their administration. So that was a fabulous outcome. But that uh, higher education building was part of our urban renewals cultural education district. So we added it in that space area where, uh, where we had already um, started building our cultural education district. It was a fabulous addition. Many, many people felt emboldened, I'm going to say, to come into my office with their visions. And um, I think that the vision document and the fact that we went out to the community, it was their document, it wasn't my document, it wasn't City Hall's document, it wasn't the mayor's document or the council's document, it was the community's document. And they continue to find ways to make Med Medford uh, a better place to live. One of the initiatives that Urban Renewal had identified uh, in their list of 10 or 12, whatever it was, uh, was Bear Creek Dam. If you looked at Bear Creek Dam back in the 80s, it was full of shopping carts and dirty socks and dead fish and pond scum uh, and it was not a pleasant uh, sight nor was it a pleasant smell. It wasn't something that I felt proud of and I think no one in our community felt proud of. And so we made it one of our initiatives for urban renewal and we determined that we needed to take out the Jackson Creek Dam. The dam was making it hard for the salmon to swim upstream to spawn. Um, it was collecting the trash that people were throwing into the creek. Uh, so we started having cleanups around the creek. They'd already been doing cleanups, but we increased it tenfold. Um, and Urban Renewal began the process of working through trying to take out the dam. Uh, we wound up having to work with 14 governmental agencies uh, from city to irrigation districts to the state to the federal government. And when we finally got to the point where we could take out the dam, um, Secretary of the Interior Babbitt came to town 
and uh, recognize this as being one of the first uh, communities to take a dam out and he got to throw the first hammer at it but um, I had the pleasure of having uh, Eric Dittmer call me and saying uh, several years later, a couple years later, Lindsay, you've got to come up to Lazy Creek. I said, where are you? He said, I'm on the corner of uh, Black Oak and Barnett. And come look, come look, and hurry. So I hopped in the car and went over there, and there were salmon spawning in Lazy Creek, and it was the first that they had spotted them. And that was uh, a very rewarding time for me personally, because I did work hard on that initiative. Um, the creek was looking so much better. It was cleaner, it was healthier. Um, people were more excited about getting in and taking out the blackberry bushes and replacing them with indigenous, indigenous, in placing them with plants that uh, <laughs> that were inhabitants that should be there. Anyway, um, indigenous, there we go. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't come. Uh, so that was an initiative that um, became a, a focal point of urban renewal. Um, one of the things that is being talked about today and honestly Eric Dittmer still calls me to come down. He does his classes along Bear Creek. He still calls me to come down and talk about how the dam came out uh, with his students. I was coming to the end of my second term of office and uh, thinking about whether or not to run again. Um, and I thought about my mother always telling me Walk away when things are good, Lindsay. Um, don't wait for it to sink in front of your eyes. Do what you can and turn it over to someone else when things are at a high. Then you'll feel good about yourself, you'll feel good about what you've done, and you'll have, uh, in your own mind, accomplished what you can accomplish. And so I thought about that and um, I also thought about the fact that I had a city manager who was a bully and every single day that I went into City Hall he would find a way to bully me. I brought it up to the city attorney and he said, I see it Lindsay, I'm sorry, but I'm hired by the city manager and I can't help you. I suggest you go and hire your own attorney. I thought, I'm not spending money on this issue. So I went to uh, Barnes & Noble and looked in their book section on how to bully the bully and uh, bought the book and when I turned around with it in my hand uh, to, to go check out, uh, there was a city attorney looking at me and I held up the book and showed him the title and he nodded uh, like, I think that's a good idea. Uh, I know that every meeting that I was in that was an executive session that wasn't um, being publicized. Um, whenever the bullying would occur, I'd look at the city manager and I could tell by his body language that, not the city manager, the city attorney, I could tell by his, the city attorney's body language that he was uncomfortable with what was happening. Um, I would call the city manager on it, but I had no council support uh, on this uh, issue. So um, after struggling with it for a long while I decided I wouldn't run for a, a third term. And it was a hard decision for me to make because I loved what I was doing but I kept in mind what my mother had said, leave on a high. So that's what I did. I left on a royal high.
Well, we have a younger population that we need to turn the downtown over to. Um, I'm working with a woman, Abigail Schilling, who's opened a Medford um, cooperative business that is internet and you it's a membership base and you buy a, a desk and um, you plug in your computer and do your business and uh, you come and go as you need it and you know at, at first I thought oh my gosh I can't believe this but she's 80 percent full today during the um, COVID and during the fire and she's managed to uh, be a going concern which is fascinating to me. So um, we need to look at how this next generation is doing business, where they're doing business, how they're doing business, and uh, have our our downtown and our business community focus in on it and make the changes they need to make. I mean, I see uh, men my age in their 70s who have uh, buildings downtown they can't fill, and it's because they don't know how to market them. They're they're stuck in my generation's thinking and unable to adapt or ad adjust to. Uh, the current generation's way of doing business. So that's one of the things that I think we need to do is is gather them up and find out what's important to them. A lot of them like to live in the downtown, so we need to be building more housing up above storefronts or business fronts. Um, we need to have more uh, restaurants that they can eat out. I'm, I'm amazed at how much they eat out. I make everything. I grow my vegetables. I make soup out of them. I freeze it for the winter. Um, but they're eating at restaurants. Um, so the whole way that they live these days, the style is different. And um, you know, we need to address that. We need to learn about it and address it and make our community work for them. You know, I'm a believer in urban-centered growth, and so, you know, I don't, I don't think that the urban growth boundary um, needs to be applied as strongly or stringently as it is. I think that when we need land or we need more housing, we can build up instead of out. I'm a proponent in saying, Medford, you're a grown-up city now, let's look like one. Let's have more um, high-rises with uh, apartment dwellings in them. Let's make them six, seven, eight stories high, um, you know, instead of going into the hinterland and taking up more land and building more single-family houses. Um, I think that's what this younger generation's looking for as well, is more urban-centered growth. They want bicycle paths and bicycle lanes in the downtown. Abigail's got a space in the back of her shop where you bring your bike in and, and you know, it's a whole room full of bicycles. Nobody's using cars. Uh, they're biking everywhere because they're conscientious of the environment and the air quality and, um, you know, pedestrian movement. I've had several high points of my life. The Cookie Connection was definitely one. I loved being in business. I loved helping the employees um, find themselves. A lot of them were young girls. Um, they would come when they were getting ready, you know, last year of high school and looking at what they were going to be doing. Um, a lot of them had low self-esteem. Um, their education wasn't uh, doing for them what it could have been. They didn't feel good about themselves. Their home life was poor. 
Uh, several of them I found sleeping in the cookie connection and found out that they'd been kicked out of their homes. They were sleeping in cars. Um, uh, so, you know, I, actually my husband accused me at one point of having a social service business, not really a cookie business, but um, I, I figured out that what they needed was to have a job and to be able to say they could do something worthwhile. I started putting together um, scholarship programs for the girls, or the employees really, who had worked at least six months and um, so that they could go to college. And several went to RCC. Uh, one who was extremely talented uh, went up to Oregon State and came back after a term and said, I can't do this. Uh, you know, it's, it's not me. I don't feel comfortable with it. I asked her if she would feel comfortable with a culinary arts program. And she said she was willing to try it. So we enrolled her up in Portland at their culinary arts school. And she uh, graduated, was hired by Intel for their food service. And then pri after that, she was hired by Marriott to head up their food program. And then she opened her own business in Portland, um, a little, in downtown Portland, a little food service, kind of lunch, early dinner business, and uh, wound up getting into the catering business and now has a very high-end, extraordinary catering business, making more money than I could ever imagine making. Um, that feels really good. So that, that is a highlight in my life. I, I helped several women get into business themselves um, and uh, used the knowledge that I had gained from having a business of my own to help others um, move forward. So that was one highlight. Uh, and another highlight was urban renewal. I loved the downtown. Uh, I loved seeing it grow. I loved seeing um, people people's spirits come up from the ashes, um, from things that were deteriorating and not being tended to. Shame on the city of Medford for letting that happen, um, but yay for urban renewal and then the city of Medford for pulling it up again. Um, it's a constant roller coaster. We have to constantly remind ourselves that we have to go through that visioning process to um, reconnect as a community, and it needs to be done as a community. A vision, for one, isn't really a vision. A vision has to be shared by everyone. And I think that was also a highlight for me, was a shared vision during my mayoral years. So, what's next? Who knows? I do have a woman-owned business that I import purses from Italy, <coughs> Italy, and um, sell them. Uh, or be opening. A, I open pop-up shops around town and try and keep active in my senior years. So I don't know. That's it. I can't think of anything else. You've worn me out. Thank you for your story. Yeah, you'll have to mince it together and make Thank it work. You for your story. You're welcome.